So welcome everyone to our uh, May uh, Dine Virtual Journal Club. Um, I'm delighted to welcome um, Abby Pratap from Sage Bio Networks to uh, lead a discussion with all of you today um, about uh, sort of indicators of retention when we start to think about using these digital technologies um, out in the wild to inform digital trials. Um, Abby, I will allow you to uh, provide a little bit of background um, about yourself before you dive into your presentation. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. For folks who are jo joining us for our uh, virtual journal club for the first time, um, just a quick note that the session is being recorded. Um, so hopefully everyone's comfortable with that. Um, Abby will start with uh, a nice overview uh, of the tremendous publication that we'll be discussing today. And then we really will throw it open for discussion. So when we open for discussion, I'll do two things. One, I'll go ahead and unmute all of you um, so that if you'd like to raise your hand, you can ask your question and engage in um, conversation directly. If for whatever reason it's challenging for you to uh, sort of ask your question, uh, just type it into either the Q&A or the chat box um, and I will be monitoring those and make sure that those questions get asked and we have an opportunity to um, to discuss those. So with no further ado, um, Abby, I will hand over to you. Um, I, I will be uh, bossy and drive the slides, so you just tell me what you need um, and when you want me to advance. Yeah, just be ready for me calling on you. Um, yeah, that's perfect start, right? So, um, hi everyone. Uh, I am Abi. I work as a principal scientist at Sage Bio Networks. That's a small nonprofit research company based out of Seattle. And just briefly about my background, I have been focusing on neuropsych research in the last few years, and the, the focus has been how do you sort of de develop, deploy technology that is able to gather real-world data, which is a jargon. Uh, basically assessing people in their real in, in their lives and um, hopefully leading to some real world evidence on underlying disease symptoms manifestations over time which is super interesting given the lack of understanding and how these uh, diseases uh, people live with them and how they evolve over time um, the work that i will be talking about to, today is sort of an after effect of my challenges right so when we deploy these studies you collect data the n starting of the study is awesome and everyone is super excited and six months or a year down the line it's our job or as in my job as a data scientist at Sage to start looking at data along with my colleagues and then we start uh, getting parsimonious about data because there are so many holes and so I, I, this is almost like a, a needed check for my own work in terms of oh I started with 10,000 people but I'm analyzing data for 500 people what happened in between um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about and I really encourage you to actually ask me any sort of uh, question that comes to your mind. Uh, I don't think manuscript is sort of, it's just basically scratching the surface of science of user attrition and let's just get started with that I guess. So um, on, on what basically is going on is there's this slew of health apps including research apps that have been launched in the last few years. And let's be also realistic, right? When I talk about healthcare apps, they are hundreds of thousands in some sense. But when you talk about research apps, they are maybe hundreds in terms of that, that are sort of driven by academia slash industry. And we all are competing for people's uh, face time on phones. So, so the starting picture should be very clear. It's not a very rosy picture that you have one app on, on the phone and you will be sort of looking, uh, your participant is looking at that all the time. You, you're basically competing with many different apps and, and the likes of uh, all the commercial apps that are out there. So that, that has to be really uh, the context here. However, given that, we don't really know how the hockey stick of digital health attrition works, right? So we all have seen this curve in many different um, literature. Um, in some people who talk about it, some don't. Um, but we don't really know what are what is driving this trend, uh, if at all anything significant, or it's just people come and people go, and what that means for a uh, future of digital health research. Um, next slide. And in fact, the, the status quo is pretty much same as 2005, which is almost 15-ish years ago. Um, there were two commentary articles from Helen Christensen and Gunther Eisenberg at Jimmer back in the days. And they really emphasize the need, and I really don't want you to read these. It's not meant for reading right now, but uh, the point is uh, the authors emphasize the need for understanding signs of user attrition in e-health trials, which are no different than the digital health of today. 
Um, but we haven't really changed the curve on that in terms of our understanding. Next slide. So given the context of what I said, including my own work, the, the goal here was to see how we can disentangle, deconvolve some of the underlying patterns and how digital health is accessed and utilized by people at scale, at least the way it is meant to be, and what are the barriers that could be addressed in the future. So it's, it's not just to say, give me data and I'll figure out all the bad things in it, but actually to learn from it and hopefully address that in the future. Next slide. So very briefly, the sample size is about 100,000 people, study, study participants data, close to 900,000 days and about 3.5 million tasks. Just want to put a double asterisk here. This is by no means exhaustive. And so the learnings from this is broad, but still limited to eight studies. However, it is incredibly hard to find user level engagement data from studies. So we have done our fair bit to release the data across the board. The link is available here. Um, it's freely available to qualified researchers worldwide. Um, and that's the reason why the publication was delayed more than six months. So it, it's, it's not super exciting to do it, but it's super relevant and important to do this and including uh, following the guidance of uh, fair principles of data sharing. So data is computable, accessible, and well provenanced. Um, so I really encourage you to look at it if you are interested in following up on this sort of research. Next slide. So we'll start with two sides, right? So there's participant enrollment. You need to enroll people uh, before you retain them. And that's the two uh, brief sort of buckets I'll talk about and before we open up for broader discussion. Next slide. We are continuing to oversample non-Hispanic whites and undersample minorities. Um, let's also make it clear, it, it might be fine from some, for some studies, right? So as long as you're able to reach the target population of your disease cohort, it doesn't have to match the census of uh, US always, but this is just based on studies that were meant to enroll a general US population with some disease focus. Um, we are seeing a significant bias in that, but it has to be put under the eyes of a uh, specific study and target population also. Next slide. This is interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so what this shows is the proportion of participants coming from each state with respect to the state's population of the, uh, in the US. And what is very clear is there are two sides, right? Uh, the over-recruited and the under-recruited. So let me just, Take home, give the take home message here where if you are an obesity researcher and you're looking at this map and trying to devise a study for real world data collection using technology, you should be worried about uh, looking at this map because the area of the US, the southern states and some midwestern states, uh, one of the highest uh, obesity prevalence. And if you are significantly under recruiting, your real world data is super biased to start with, first of all. So, uh, these have implications in many different disease areas. I just gave one example. Next slide. The next one would be, and so this was simple, right? I mean, you get the data, you look at, you look at it and that's fine. I mean, but it's important to understand what that means. Um, the next one is to do some more statistical modeling and trying to see how trends hold across time and over time. Um, I'm gonna be showing you a lot of uh, survival plots, which are sort of trends borrowed from oncology research. The point is Y axis is survival probability, X axis, how much time, uh, in, uh, uh, what percent of sample remains in the study over time, that's the X axis. The eight lines here are basically showing each studies and the take home message is 50% of the study participants leave the study in the first week or so. So the take home would be, a targeted communication strategy during the first week will be incredibly helpful. When we sign up for a Gmail, you actually get an email on the second day, first day, and maybe a couple of days down the line, um, depending on your use case. So companies are doing it, uh, researchers should, should do it as well. Um, next one. This is rather involved, but I'll just sort of give you the take home message here. Uh, if we do look at the same survival plot, but su sub facet the cohort based on minimum number of days they stay in the study, you clearly see a very interesting trend, not, rather not surprising, but if you wait just a week in terms of before you do your randomization, your cohort median survival time increases by 25 days roughly. That's a lift curve in some sense where it might be interesting to have a cool off or run-in period in a study where you are letting people sort of explore the study and then enriching the cohort. Uh, 
you might have some people who will go away, so the bias will not be addressed, but you will still have more power in your study to detect the change that you are going after. Next. All right, so I, I know I'm going a little fast. Hopefully you have questions and we can discuss that uh, in the next, uh, after the next few minutes. Um, so now the take home message across few sociodemographic factors, I'm only showing a few here. Um, older population remain engaged for significantly longer. So the, the point is, if you are focused on retaining, uh, if you're focused on younger cohort, you have to think about uh, efforts and how you can retain them over time. There's a significant difference on, on that. Next slide. Um, so if your study is uh, looking at case sort of case control status between disease and healthy, um, participants with the clinical condition of interest to the study remains engaged in a study for significantly longer. This will have a drastic impact on real world studies trying to collect data from both disease and healthy. So the effort on recruiting and retaining the healthy cohort is equally important as disease cohort if your study is interested in, in both uh, um, healthy and disease population. This was super interesting for me, so bias alert, right? Um, there was two studies uh, which had a component of recruitment uh, through clinical partnering sites. So uh, sim as simply put, uh, people who were coming to clinical sites, they were rec uh, recommended by their clinician to uh, join a study. No data from the study was shared back with the uh, clinician, so it's not like it has impacted clinical care in any sense. But there is a significant difference, as you can see, order of magnitude almost in terms of people who were recommended by clinicians or clinical sites and how they partner and, and, and actually um, engage in the study, which is super interesting for future of digital health in terms of getting an e-prescription from EHR and an app directly comes on your phone and you can think from there on. Next slide. Um, so the journey is interesting in the sense that a participant starts in a, uh, in, a, in a research study app. The blue or sign box here basically shows the days in which they do something. So what we can do, uh, so far I have talked about supervised learning. So you have a label when they are going or leaving the study, et cetera. But what, what can you learn from unsupervised label-free learning? Next slide. So we tried to collapse all of these participant days. X-axis is day one to 84, Y-axis is clusters that I'm gonna talk about. And each green dot here is basically something that the part, if, if a participant did anything in that particular study. Um, and so it, you, it's, it's very clear there are very significant clusters and similar behavior across the studies. The take home message, next uh, slide on this is these clusters are not just different because they, they are different based on engagement, but they are also indicative of underlying social demographic differences. So minorities actually are in, enriched significantly more in cluster C to C3 to C5, which is uh, sad, but it is what the data is telling us. Next. So what does it all means, right? I mean, um, the question that anyone should ask is, so what? Um, I, I think it's really important to understand to have a, a live dashboard of who you are enrolling and sort of monitor it on the go in terms of whether it's representative of your target cohort. If not, stop and do something. Otherwise, data will come and you will have no option thereafter. Retention is interesting. Even if the participant who are leaving the study, which is high, it's actually very unique. It's first time we are able to see that difference that has never been able to capture in a traditional clinical trial because these people are, there's a significant selection bias on people who actually show up to a clinical site because they have to see the ad, get out of their bed, go drive to a clinical site, and that enriches for various biases. Uh, whereas you can see here, uh, you might not get the data, but you might see who is coming and, and leaving soon and what needs to be done in future. Um, there are various other things that one can do. Uh, based on the results we have shown, we can do targeted just-in-time engagement interventions, which can lead to ABC testing trying different communication strategies, engagement strategies, even including financial incentives that I didn't talk about, so we can discuss in Q&A. And it's finally really important to understand the uh, design and I mean, the end user needs through user-centered design, which I have not talked about, but we can talk more about it during Q&A. And lastly, um, machine learning is as good as what data you feed in. So to understand what the biases therein are super important. Last slide on the next one. <clears throat> 
Um, it's, so we have shown through preliminary work some, with some of my colleagues um, that it can actually impact uh, the learning. So what your final AUC or your signal would be probably confounded by underlying uh, confounders that are due to underrepresentation or representational bias in the data. And then last one, picture here, next slide. Oh. Oops. <laughs> Um, this is actually four years ago, my own same hand uh, and same time. So there is no bias in that sense. And you can see the difference in the heart rates. I'm not insinuating here anything in terms of the technology or company. I'm just saying these are things that can happen and we need to think about it. And the underlying data capture and analysis can actually make a huge impact. Um. Avi, that's fantastic. I can't believe how much you were able to cover just in some brief introductory remarks. So as usual, you are um, my hero in all these things. Um, I'm going to put this up as a placeholder and I can already see some folks have their hands raised. For people who joined a couple seconds late, um, we will use uh, the majority of this time um, with Avi to uh, pick his brain as an expert and engage in discussion. So let's start. Um, Pip, I can see you have your hand raised. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself and speak. Hi. Uh, thanks for that uh, that presentation. I'm trying to look after kids at the same time, so I was sort of in and out. So I'm hoping that I got the got the gist of that. And it, I, I like that point at the end where you said about sort of just in time intervention to kind of re retain um, patients. Now, we do a lot of this when we're doing sort of um, daily diary uh, work, where we're doing the you know, patients fill in a daily diary. Hopefully, they fill it in every day electronically at home. Um, and if they don't, you, you prompt them. But it seems to be suggesting from your work, if I got this right, and I may not have, given, given my attention was split, it seems to be suggesting that maybe there's different interventions for different uh, clusters. Have you got any thoughts on that, or have you looked into that? Or yeah, so I, I have some hypotheses. I have not had the fortune to test them so far. Um, so there's one clear hypothesis that a lot of people, a majority of them are leaving on the second day, which is basically you come in, you see, and you leave, right? And that's a big cluster. Um, hopefully it was clear, or maybe not. Um, so having a communication and engagement uh, ABC testing or AB testing, I think would be in very interesting. The actual content is super important and they are behavioral communication experts much beyond my expertise to write and develop that content and have a experiment with that. It's not rocket science, it's not new. All tech companies do that. Just like LinkedIn does it, you are 10% away from having a super profile. So please give me more personal data. I don't mean that. Um, but that's, that's a, how behavior sort of nudges are done in, in real life. And so there's a lot of scope in that. Unfortunately, I don't have any actual factual data to give you more insights. Oh, thanks for that. But uh, that you're saying that really like a good area of uh, research going forward is to take what you're saying is in there are these different clusters yeah. and the engagement is unlikely to be one size fits all. Would that be, would that be fair? I think so. I think one stark thing that came out from the cluster analysis is the proportions might be different across the studies, but underlying human behavior was extremely the same, same, right? There's a lot of asterisks involved. The studies were incredibly different. Obviously, there were different protocols, etc. But given all that, we still see a very similarish human behavior of altruism, dedicated users, people who stick around for three weeks, people will, uh, will work or will function for about one week. And then the cross-sectional study, basically where people come and give you the data on day one and maybe some more days and go away. I, I think that cluster is also super important because yes, digital health is about longitudinal, but I think it's equally beneficial about cross-sectional if you can go uh, pretty wide. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. And I think that like we can probably dig into like a large range of like existing stuff like you alluded to with like uh like commercial sort of um ways of dragging people back in, in, into our into our research and maybe build on that. So yeah, really good things to think about. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um Pip, fantastic questions and follow-up. Um Emily, I can see that your hand is raised. So why don't um you unmute yourself and go next and then Quentin, I'll come to your question in the QA next. Great, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great, thank you so much. Um, I thought this was fantastic um, and, and really, really a much needed uh, piece of work here. I'll be so thank you so much. Um, my question is around the, 
diversity, recruiting for and building tools for diversity? Did any of these uh, studies attempt specific strategies towards recruiting and sustaining diversity enrollment? Um, and if not, how would you potentially go about it in the new cohort? I'm so glad you asked that. Even if I don't know the answer, this is super important. Um, so I, I want to put a very, very careful asterisk here that I don't want to comment on all the subtle details that I don't know about individual studies because they have done a lot of work in areas. I'm going to comment based on what I have seen from the papers that I've read about individual study outcomes and having involved in a couple of the studies myself. Um, I think primarily the focus was uh, let's build it and they will come. Uh, I mean it in a very good way because everyone was getting started. No one really knew what to do. And it's basically let's partner and develop a study and hopefully a lot of people will come. So many were feasibility studies in, in some sense, as you will see in their papers as well. Uh, but what we have learned, and there are very successful models being deployed on top of this. So now to your second question, I would highly recommend uh, the strategy adopted by all of us that I have the fortune of being involved in. That's the Precision Medicine Initiative of NIH or US government. Um, they have really partnered well with uh, various health providers, um, um, so HPOs, and then also working with other institutions to have direct volunteers being involved. And if you see their uh, New England Journal of Medicine recent paper sometime six months ago or so, uh, it shows the success of their recruitment strategy in which a majority of their cohort is UBR, underrepresented in biomedical research. So the short form of basically this is um, you really need to make this as part of your protocol design and have dollars associated with it. Uh, that is always a challenge sometimes because it's a post hoc thought. Partnership with clinical organizations, community organizations, patient advocacy group is super important. And not just for optics, dare I say that, it really needs to be um, aligned with the people's need and having a clear, well-articulated value proposition or lack thereof is super important. So you have trustful handshake and it's not just give me the data. I know I've said a lot, and there are many papers that, that I can point you to, which unfortunately are not on the slides, but happy to share that. Thank you so much, fantastic. Um, Abby, I think that's terrific, and I really like that you pointed towards all of us as a study that's specifically thinking about those underrepresented groups. It's a good reminder. Um, Needy, I can see that your hand is raised, but I'm going to, um, I'm going to go across to, to Quentin's question because he's been waiting. Um, Quentin, um, if you would like to unmute yourself, I'll give you a hot second if you'd like to ask your question directly. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. yes, we can. Okay, great. I think my, my question is partially answered already. So in fact, it was first I'd like to thank you because I think it's really extremely interesting to see this. Um, so I'm working for a pharmaceutical company, EMD Serono, and we are always interested to know what happens with application in a clinical trial. But I'd like to understand from your point of view, if you did see that some of the features from the application itself can really influence the retention. Uh, I think you pointed out to the, the behavioral science, but I just want to mention that four to five years ago, um, you know, this was a bit forgotten by pharmaceutical company when they were developing application. And do you see some features that are, would be relevant now? And, and how would this uh, feature depend on population? In particular, I think you mentioned the uh, older population being more prone to retention. Uh, is there something that works better for young patients or old patients? Do you have any idea on this? Yeah, so as far as what is better in some, some specific feature, we did not sort of disentangle the app or study specific features, obviously, because that was outside the scope. But I have a few things to say on that. Um, the one thing which we did not do intentionally is to compare retention to primary outcomes or secondary outcomes. Um, not because it's not interesting. I think it's super interesting, but we were not able to do that across the study. So it was really hard. That being said, there are some studies where that has been worked out already, or at least of interest to me, where if you are depressed, does that mean um, you will more likely give more data or less data? And if there is a participation gap in studies, 
is that because someone is not interested or is that also indicative of a local flare up of disease? Um, and how does that sort of impact data collection? Now to tie it back to the last thing you said about pop the population, because I think I said something about conditions at least, um, there yep. are differences by population in some studies, not all the studies. And I can point to you to Brighton study, which was real world another assessment of depression. There is a huge difference. Um, it's not covered here for reasons I just said, but um, for example, Hispanic Latinos are significantly un, uh, less likely to be engaged uh, compared to other counterparts. That's, that's a big challenge. And I, I have a paper in Jimmer where this is discussed as a primary outcome. And, and I'll, I don't know how I can send you more information later, but I'll definitely pass it on to Jen. Maybe we can add this as a slide a link and then circulate it later. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Abby, let's do that. Send me anything and we'll add a resources slide. That's a really good idea. And so maybe just if I can, I can have another question. It's related to this was really in the context of clinical trials or let's say specific studies. But do you know if the kind of, uh, uh, let's say, retention or Kaplan-Meier curves that we, you get there are representative also of, you know, uh, real world uh, cases? Like we've seen this app from uh, Omada or Livongo that are so successful. I'm always curious to know whether uh, real world use looks like what you see in clinical trial. Okay, so uh, I can go a lot on that uh, without a lot of data because it's not available, right? So let's just start by saying, uh, without naming any names, because um, that's not the goal here, you can have 95% compliance in a study with 10% retention. So what I mean by that is you can have 10% of the cohort retained over 12 weeks, but the folks who were retained across each week can have 95% compliance. The mm -hmm. problem is the definition and the lack of misunderstanding, if not transparency around it. And, and it's really hard to do a comparison across papers by different groups if you are not comparing apple, different varieties of apples because people tend to compare actually apples and oranges, uh, which is unfair. So. <laughs> what I can say is, um, it's, I will, let me try to make sure if I say it right. It's important to have the raw data shared. There is no privacy concern whatsoever if you do it responsibly because you're not, sometimes you don't even need to share the primary outcome, right? I mean, you can share like we have done without releasing any primary outcome data. We have shared individual day level data. And if we do that, we can better understand the claims of some of these awesome apps out there, which I also use, but I just don't know beyond compliance or beyond retention in 12 weeks or 12 years. I just don't know what happens in between that. All right, thanks. I've got the same concern. Um, Quentin, that was a terrific question. Thank you so much. And I'm glad, Avi, it gave you the opportunity to talk a little bit about sort of what perhaps we can infer from missingness other than the data is missing. I think of, you know, pain as being something that, um, you know, if you're feeling better, are you as motivated to continue to record your pain levels, you know, um, or conversely, um, you know, if you're feeling worse with a sort of depressive disorder, does that disincentivize you from sort of continuing to participate? I think it's really interesting and I'm, I'm delighted the question sort of teased that out a bit. So um, Nidhi, I'm going to go to you next um, and then Eric and then Dan. So Nidhi, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, so one of your slides mentioned that the older population was more... Um, into the clinical trial, I don't want to use the word into, but it, I don't want to even use the word adhering because it's different from retention. But I think my question is more about how much of a role did the UI play here with, with respect to the older population and the younger population? Because I find it a little bit counterintuitive that the younger population was was opting out and uh, the older population was sticking to it. I understand that one of one of the points could be that the severity of the disease could be uh, high, uh, the severity of the disease is more in the older population, but but having a 
but if the UI of the app is bad, then I think that also would be demotivating for the older population to stay in the clinical trial. Or, or younger population as well, right? So let's start yeah. by clear limitation. We did no work whatsoever in evaluating a qualitative difference between the onboarding experience and, and long-term experience in e any study. But that's the reason why we did study level analyses. And whenever there is a summary statistics presented, it's always stratified by a study. And so it's, it's sort of accounting for study level variations. Um, if I showed you the plot for age study wise, that the differences will be actually more significant in some studies and more prominent. Um, that being said, I believe there's a lot of confounding going on here. So let me be self-critical, right? Um, because of incredible amount of missingness, which is just uh, probably covered in supplement details, uh, super important stuff, we were not able to correct for many different things in individual analysis. So when we look at age, we do not correct for um, clinical condition of interest, which is likely to be severely co correlated with age, but we are presenting each bucket individually. Um, at least a way, it's not the most sort of um, kosher way, but we limit why. Um, so I completely agree, first of all, older population stays longer is not just because they are old, um, they also have likeliness of more severe disease and uh, some of the diseases that we have looked in our data actually are more prevalent in the older population. So there are multiple factors driving that. But if you look at a very abstract level, which might not be always a statistician's best call, um, you are seeing a trend where young people will come explore and go away unless and this is where I'm sort of hypothesizing at this point, unless there is a clear value proposition, most of these app tend to have a very similar experience, right? I, I have used each app individually in, in the back in the days. Um, I think, yes, uh, almost every app. And I can say, except one, none returned any information back to the participant in a way that people are talking about these, uh, these days. So remember, this is 2015 when this started and we are talking about that data now. So there is a big gap in what was done and developed back in the days versus what we are thinking about now. But I'm glad we are. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for your question, Nidhi. And, and, and Pip, I can see your uh, your comment there in the chat that's sort of relevant to this conversation as well. Um, the difference between teenagers and adults, and I think for anyone with kids at home right now is probably feeling that uh, on, on all manner of fronts. Um, so I'm going to go to Eric next, um, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself, um, and then we'll go to Dan and then to Nia. Great, thanks. Um... I'll be wonderful presentation as um, we discussed recently. So I was really looking forward to this uh, really great work. Um, this is a question about, um, not surprisingly for me, uh, a, a question about the missingness patterns. Uh, and, and this touches on um, what, what um, we had just been discussing. Uh, we can go into detail, uh, obviously, many, many days after the call about this, but um, did you all uh, try to uh, model the propensity for retention at each uh, time point, or at least uh, regularly at, at certain intervals during the study? Uh, and then question two was, um, did you see a, a significant amount of um, intermittent missingness? So people dropping out then coming back in, uh, and if so, how did you uh, sort of take a general approach to handling that? I see you, you work with um, Patrick Hagerty, so I'm sure this was top of mind for uh, him, at least, uh, in, in writing that. Yes, um, you've spoken like a stats person, absolutely, which is awesome. A um, couple of things, right? We started with looking at retention at a very granular level from day and sometimes even within day and sort of model it over time. And then we quickly realized uh, that it was beyond the time bandwidth that we all had. So we settled on the total time in the study, which is basically the last day in your study, which hides out a lot of the journey because we're talking about the last date. Um, so in the initial retention analysis, which is the couple mile survival stuff I showed you, we did not really account for sort of, uh, uh, how do I say it, uh, people come and go and how does that sort of impact and whether they are coming and going due to randomness or there's something else going on in the study. Um, we did not account for that at all. 
Um, then we went to the unsupervised side where we started looking at day level and not within day level, um, where we started to see some interesting trends. But then we, it sort of dawned upon us, okay, let's do a you know, time between uh, days analysis and see if there's a significant difference. And essentially it basically was very clear there is an altruistic population which will come and do it every day and that's dependent on certain social demographics. And then there are people who will stick around for a few weeks and then so on and so forth. We did not really see a significant pattern of comers, goers and comers sort of come and go sort of approach. But I think that probably is an artifact of the data maybe um, that we haven't fully explored. The reason I'm saying that, in one study which I have been involved in, in during my PhD research, uh, which is Brighton, we definitely saw a lot of non-random missing data. Uh, and what does that mean in with respect to primary outcomes is something I have dawned upon, but I have not really worked on it. Great, thank you, thanks so much. But that could be a good collaboration, data is available. I intend to fully look at that link after the call. Thank you. <laughs> These are the conversations that make me happy, guys. I love it. Um, Dan, would you like to pose your question next? Uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, is Dan eligible to ask? Sorry, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I know. This is probably not fair. Normally, I sit right down the hall from Avi, so maybe this is not fair. Um, <laughs> great, great talk, obviously, as always. And I wonder if you could talk about because compensation is something that is highly effective and perhaps not surprising, I wonder if you could talk about the perception of compensation um, within a digital health context. So yeah. the framing for this being, well, you know, pay one ninety nine for an app that it took someone three years to make? No way, that's way too expensive. Um, and I wonder if you could just talk about what it means to compensate someone in this uh, for, for units of currency, we don't talk about absolute values here, but yeah. rel relative perception of compensation for uh, participating in a study, maybe different types of data collection, and then how someone might uh, account for this or budget for it when they're thinking about a digital health yeah. study or how you might structure compensation. Uh, Jen, do you mind if I could take the screen control back from you? It's, it's okay. hilarious, I'll tell you why. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I will stop sharing and it's all you, Abby. All right, thank you. I love that question, Dan, and we did not plant it, guys, for sure. Uh, okay, so look at the slide that I was trying to make late last night and then I skipped it, um, so it's not presented, and I really want to talk about fair compensation model that could be really used and what's the optics of it. But before we go there, I think what Dan is asking is actually super interesting, so let me just show this point, or oh, hopefully people can see it. It actually depends a lot on what you're trying to get out of the study. Um, if you can follow my cursor here, the C1 cluster in Brighton, and Brighton is the only study that paid people incentives over time in 12 weeks, $75 were paid, and we'll come to how many dollars later. You can see the proportion of people in the altruistic or dedicated cluster is highest across the study. I mean, just visually speaking, and even the C2 cluster looks very distinct from other studies. It's almost like sort of a regular participation and so on. It really sort of depends from there on the question is, are you really wanting to ask and pro people daily or semi-weekly? Or you're trying to fill in the gaps between the episodic clinical evaluation, which are monthly, six monthly, whatever the time cadence is. And that should drive your question about financial incentive. I know I don't have a lot of empirical data beyond one study, but based on some of my other experiences, um, I would highly recommend, and I, mean, I promise to send you these links, there are two seminal papers um, that uh, are from these two researchers. I don't know them personally. They really talk about a fair compensation model that is not coercive and essentially trying to answer the question, should you and how much should you pay your participants? Uh, the addition that I have based on data is long-term engagement could be achieved also by non-monetary incentives such as social and behavioral economic methods that I don't have data about, but I know about these methods. Um, and they'd really help, uh, the, these are, this is the approach followed by all the tech companies, right? The behavioral change methods, which are out there. It's not uh, rocket science anymore. You just have to have resources to implement those. Um, but if you want constant nudge for certain use cases and, and a higher adherence and participation, 
then having a non-coercive fair compensation model is probably a good way, not the best way, but a good way. And it's also not scalable, depending on your use case. Dan, you still around? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, thanks, Avi. Oh, uh, this is great, as always. And I, I see a comment from, from Philip, too, in the chat that uh, compensation is difficult. And I would say anything where you're trying to implement, uh, you know, behavioral change within an app is going to be difficult as well. And I think that's why, Avi, your work is important to highlight. You know, if we're just talking about dollars relative to effectiveness or, or time spent relative to effectiveness, uh, it could be very useful. And, and Avi's quantified that, how, how much effort we should be putting into making something like fair compensation work. I'll add a brief anecdotal point here. I was presenting something similar in one of the slides in, in, in Hawaii, and someone asked me, you can't pay people whatsoever. There is, there's just no way you can do that. So first, ignorance is bliss. Sometimes, uh, and, and some, you're probably not aware of uh, all the user-centered studies and design studies that pay people, so that's a myth that it's not real. Uh, but then I also said, why will I present this at a conference if someone will not pay you and me to be there? So thinking about just doing it for altruism all the time is probably a myth as for me. Anyways. Fantastic. Um, and this is such a great question. Um, Dan, thank, thank you for asking. Um, cause it's certainly, um, Pip and Lee, I see your, your notes in, in the column here, in the chat here. Um, and I'll be really, really interesting to hear the, the reaction you got at previous conferences. So definitely ripe for, for further, um, exploration. Um, I think, um, so I'm going to go to Tania next, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and then John, I'll ask your question after that. I'm having some difficulty hearing you. Can you hear me now? Better. In a pretty musical way. Hi, Tanir. <laughs> Hi, uh, can you hear me now? Is it better now? Okay, great. Hi all, uh, this is Sunny uh, from Hoffman LaRoche and uh, looks like it's all old folks meeting together as a party. <laughs> Thank you Odi for, uh, for this impressive work. I, I have a zillion questions but I'm going to in the interest of time restrict to two but before that I'll also make a comment. Like, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in terms of uh, compensation. Compensation is usually, uh, people visualize it as uh, pain, paper usage, but compensation can also come from different means. Uh, it's not just economic compensation, you can also compensate uh, differently in different ways. We are trying to uh, learn about it, we are trying to, uh, from a pharma perspective, we are trying to do this uh, in a different way, but unfortunately the problem seems to be like the compensation is usually visualized as internship, so you need to be a bit more careful that you are making a behavioral intervention and that could be positive or negative. So that has a huge impact. So you cannot keep on paying them. And what is the correct pay is also a question there. So it, it, it is altogether a different discussion. So I just wanted to make place that come in here for the crowd to think about it. Uh, I have two questions. My first question, Abhi, the cluster analysis is really impressive. And I was looking at these clusters. Uh, if you look at the underdeserved population, there is this huge variability between uh, clusters, let's say the high utilizers versus low utilizers, correct? Have you observed any differences, any other demographic differences in the underdeserved population between these two different clusters? And I'm specifically talking about, let's say, the C1 versus C5 for the Hispanic Latino population here. Yeah, so um, let me just make sure I say it right. right. Um, we did find uh, and reconfirm some of our supervised analysis. So things like um, age and um, there was one more that I'm blanking on right now. Um, so there was age, there was race, and there's one more, I think it was education or economic status, sorry, I don't remember that. It's not covered. Uh, the reason is this, right? And this is where it go goes to another important facet. Uh, 
there is incredible amount of missingness in these studies, which I believe there is a plot in the supplement which talks about it. So one thing that I probably should have done a more uh, articulate job about is people are not putting enough pressure, I guess in some sense, on thinking about how to collect baseline demographics data. And if you don't do that, any of this is all moot, right? You just don't know what happened. So you will get a unsupervised cluster um, analysis done, but it will be very hard to compare labels. And if you do have some labels, there is significant amount of missingness and you don't want to impute demographics labels all the time. I, I really don't like it for this sort of analysis. So long story short, uh, we were limited by a huge amount of missingness across the studies. Within studies, there is interesting trends, right? So if you, if you talk about Brighton study, which was monetary incentives and an intervention, we saw significant differences across um, uh, population in terms of their education, their employment, uh, but it's all confounded and well understood in depression literature because people are disparately, uh, sorry, uh, un un they are impacted in a very different way based on their underlying social demographic characteristics. So there's a confounding that is also playing into this. So, uh, if I understand it correctly, the, the confounding factor is not clearly understood because of the lack of data. Yeah, there, there, is, there is incredible amount of sparsity which prevented from some more analysis that could have been done. The reason why I wanted to make that comment was basically, uh, we also tried, or we were successful in terms of recruiting underrepresented population, but we were not really successful in terms of retaining them. And the majority of the studies moving forward they have, I think they sort of figured out how to recruit, but still they haven't figured out what is the retention model for all these populations. Of course, it's not one size fits all. Uh, my second question is, even though the title was more on digital health, certainly down, delved down in terms of like smartphone applications. Is there any data do you know or it's available or is there any work that's happening around other than the applications, the smartphone apps, uh, more in terms of digital devices as such? Um, in terms of devices, I am not aware of any academic group in looking at engagement. There are many groups, that I'm sure Jen might have more insights into that. Uh, there are folks out of Duke that have done some work in comparing wearables, but I'm not sure if uh, they have looked at retention in those. I, I might be naive about it. But yeah, just starting. <laughs> there you go. Um, so that's that. But I'm need of that. sorry. Go ahead, Tanir. I said need of that. <laughs> um, the other thing that I am personally involved in is it actually Jen has the right picture right now. I am trying to do some work on filling in the gaps in the gray area based on passive data collection across health kit in these studies. Um, uh, thank you. And so we have some. We are doing some work in trying to understand uh, in C3, C4, maybe C2 clusters. How does passive data fill in the gap? And that's very interesting, both in terms of the biases we have seen pretty much early in the days, and then is it really filling in the gap or not? We'll we'll, we'll have more to say in six months. Lastly, um, I and this is bias alert, obviously, because I'm speaking for my own work. Um, I'm working with a large organization, nonprofit organization in the US that screens about one American every minute for depression. So we are looking at data from about uh, 2 million Americans in the last five years who have screened for depression. So that's web-based. And so we will know more from a different aspect of engagement in a very free-flowing um, DIY screening in the next six months also. Thank you, thank you, and also big thanks for curating this data and making it available for us from mine. It's a huge effort. Thank you so much. Agreed, and thanks, Tania, for a great couple of questions. Um, John, would you like to ask your question next? I'll give you a second in case you want to unmute yourself. If not, I can ask, and then um, Bernadette will come to you for the final question after that. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to ask. Um, Avi, thanks for the great work and the presentation. Um, given what you've learned, from the study that you conducted and what still needs to be learned. My question is, it's really, it's kind of two parts. From a broad perspective, do we as an industry need to establish some basic behavioral and social economic questions to incorporate uh, into uh, 
studies prospectively so we can assess participants' decisions to participate in these remote trials? And if so, is this an area where not only collecting study-specific control group information would be value, but actually establishing normative databases do you think would be value? That's an incredibly loaded question, but super awesome in terms of making me think through it, right? I think half of it I have never even thought through. Um, but what I'm going to say is um, whenever industry launches a product, there's a clear protocol on how to A-B test it in a small group and then a somewhat larger group before a launch. And then even in the launch, there is an alpha, beta, et cetera. I think we need to do something similar in digital health um, studies. What this means is incredible amount of resources, which probably will not suffice under uh, standard R01s, if the uh, academicians here can understand what I mean. The budgets sometimes are not really sort of supporting all the stuff that a digital health re uh, com app requires. Uh, come to think of it, right? We, you are competing for FaceTime compared to a Facebook app or a Gmail app or et cetera, which are very robust apps, right, by all means. So, there are multiple things that are going on, including lack of uh, testing, well-studied, well-understood behavioral science interventions that are not medical interventions, but that are engagement interventions. And we have seen some work, uh, especially from, uh, why am I blanking on the name? Um, uh, oh, that's too bad. Uh, there's a very famous researcher out of Harvard and Michigan who has done a lot of work in this area. And I don't know why I'm having a, a brain crash right now. Um, and they have done a lot of work in that area trying to assess um, just-in-time uh, engagement interventions and many other interventions that could be very useful. Long story short, it would be nice to think, thank you, Eric, uh, Susan Murphy. Um, um, yeah, so I would recommend you to, uh, if, you are, have all, if you have not seen her literature from her, please do check it out. It's amazing in terms of what could be done, but it's also asking us the question, how do we do that? It is incredibly difficult to deploy those in open source settings, unless researchers think about pooling in resources to create a framework. And there are some out there to, to let these JITAI, just-in-time uh, engagement interventions to be deployable and tested. Okay, thank you. Fantastic, great question, John. Um, Bernadette, did I see that you had your hand raised? Would you like to ask the final question? Yes, greetings everyone. Um, Bernadette from Germany. I'm calling from Germany. So, um, my, I have a, maybe I'm a little bit uh, mixed up, but my question is how can this, um, um, this bias, this technology bias, how can we minimize it within the context of even uh, not just the, the digital health studies, but also if we have to go into the normal clinical trials, because since we are also moving into, the, uh, into, into this digital uh, age, and I believe in future, we are going to uh, be experiencing more remote uh, clinical trials. So I was thinking of on one hand, if I have to do a long-term uh, uh, cohort studies, how can I minimize this bias? And on the other hand, if I will have to do like what many people are doing now for short, for short-term uh, 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 clinical studies, uh, uh, clinical trials uh, studies, how can we minimize the technology bias? Is it? Um, I, I think I missed out on the second part, but we'll come to it. Um, the, the first half of your question was actually is, is somewhat easy. And the reason I say so is as long as we think about monitoring these studies when they are launched um, and throughout and not a post hoc analysis like I have done, that's the worst thing you can do if you are a study, if you are designing the study and looking at your data after data collection. I think this should be a weekly or maybe some sort of a semi-weekly exercise to monitor your recruitment incoming cohort as they come. See when you have reached a threshold in certain buckets, stop recruitment in those buckets if needed, if needed, uh, depending on your resources and move to buckets to make sure your target cohort representation is well managed in your study. It doesn't have to match the census of US, like I said, just to be very clear, 
task. Um, so having a study level dashboard, aggregate stats will work, right? I mean, let's keep it simple. We don't have to keep it super complicated. And then if you have to pause, think about where you can find uh, those relevant participants and what you need to achieve to gain their trust and let them join those the, your study. And that could mean reaching out to various patient advocacy groups, justifying what your study does, what are the pros and cons, what are the risks for certain population and how you have addressed them. Um, if you are paying, why you are paying, uh, having that sort of a clean discussion and a partnership with clinical sites in your target population area of interest are the best and probably the cheapest way to do that. There are a boatload of tech and AI companies which will say we're going to reach out um, and do targeted recruitment for certain populations. We have worked with one in Brighton's version two study that is published in Jimmer and we did not see any significant impact of working with an AI recruitment company, quote unquote AI, um, to, to help recruit target populations. Um, partnerships with real sites as the best way to go forward. Abby, fant fantastic. And Bernadette, thank you so much for asking a terrific question. So um, with that, we're coming towards the top of the hour. So I want to make sure we let everyone go on time. Abby, this was terrific. Thank you so much for the hard work that you're doing. Thank you for coming um, and spending your time and sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, and thank you for everyone on the line for being such uh, terrific participants, having great questions. I think this speaks to the importance of the topic and, and I always love these sessions. Um, before, before I let you go, I, uh, I just want to, to flag some more upcoming DIME events. So Virtual Journal Club, I think is really valuable to actually be able to sort of chat one-on-one -on -one um, with our experts. So next month we have uh, Camille Nebeke coming in to talk about uh, uh, sort of precision health um, and how we can use sort of social and behavioral sciences um, in advancing that vision and specifically how we can think about the role of technology. So join us for that if you can. Um, also later this month, um, we have our lightning speed crowdsourcing session. So this is um, another terrific um, event in our calendar. These are monthly, they're just half an hour. Um, our presenters come, they pose a problem to our community, they take three minutes and then they, um, they seek your feedback. Um, this, uh, the, the topic for this is um, all around uh, patient engagement. So I think follows nicely on the heels um, of our conversation today. So Abi, thank you so much again. Um, we uh, were honored to host you. Uh, everyone on the line, thank you so much for joining us. Um, terrific questions. I learned a lot from all of you. So stay safe, everyone. Thanks again for joining. Thank you, folks. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. -bye. Thanks, bye.